transactions with with receipts or whatever money was at the time. And so I've been thinking about this a lot recently, and I wonder if you've thought about this at all, because you mentioned it earlier before that, you know, and let's say in the modern time, we could use something like oil as a way of backing the creation of credit during uh, the time of FDR. And as well as I think in the time of Hamilton, this was it would have been gold and silver that was used. Now, is there a way or is it maybe too radical to think this way to um, create a form of credit that isn't necessarily attached to some type of like natural resource like gold or oil, but more based off of this principle that you're talking about the common good or, you know, the human resource, right. Our, our, our creative capacity, which is essentially immeasurable. Um, right. So that's essentially my question. Has there been, have you put any thought to it? Has there well, been anything developed? You're dealing with two different things. What I suggested to Bahari is, is back in 1997, he was made chairman of the Petroleum Trust Fund. And as I mentioned to you, African currencies in Nigeria is called the Naira, N-A-I-R-A. They're, they're not convertible. So my, my suggestion was you use the oil as a collateral base to borrow money, to lend money. The gold standard actually is not based on uh, trading gold. It's the gold standard is set up to settle accounts with a common a commodity with an approved upon value that can't be speculated against. And we've been involved in speculating for the last 50 years, but on the, on the Roosevelt's bread and woods, it, there was a band of uh, movement of, of the price of gold. So it wasn't really, it was a gold exchange rather than a based on gold, there's a, there's a difference. What we should try to set up is uh, some kind of international system, some New Bretton Woods could be the name of it, where you do establish a commodity to settle accounts. But the, the credit ultimately is based on the productivity and the labor power of the nation involved. So the, the stronger a nation, the more the, the strength of its currency. The problem you have in Africa is it's been so raped, it is so poor that they need assistance just to get the credit to get them started. Once you would have a functioning, healthy, robust economy, and I think the, the difficulties would tend to lessen significantly, which is why China's help is uh, very important because they're giving lines of credit. We could give a line of credit from the United States like a credit card. We could say, here, right. let's build Transaqua. By the way, the United States has never said anything about Transaqua. There's no involvement. The only country in Europe, in the world, of the West that's involved is Italy. Italy is very supportive of pushing forward Transaqua. Let's say the United States changed its attitude. We would give a line of credit to an authority, the Transaqua Development Authority. And that line of credit would then be used begin to pay for what is necessary to build the project. That money would then be dispersed into the economy. People would be hired. Families could, would get paychecks. Children would have schools. I mean, that's on the most simplest level. So think of it right now that African, a lot of people say Africa doesn't need help. And a lot of Africans who I know, friends of mine, they also get carried away. They say, we don't want anyone's help. We don't need anyone's help. It's not, it's not true. Well, no strings attached help kind of maybe. 
Well, I, I don't want to take over anything, but lines of credit are one of the best things we can do to help these countries get back on their feet. And once they were on their feet, I mean, it's a shame that if you can, you know, Euro is, you can change the Euro for dollars in the United States, you can change the pound, you can change all kinds of currencies, but you can't change a single African currency. The strongest one is the Rand from South Africa. But, so that's how I would view it. It, it doesn't have to be any one way. It, if, it, if we can set up an acceptable way of an institution, it would be better if we had a global institution that issued credit. Right. Because all you're doing is giving people the opportunity to invest in something. Frankly, if we were really smart and altruistic, we could give the money away. I mean, we could give Africa billions of dollars. We're spending that much now on burying the dead and security. We could give the money away and it would be profitable because the Afri if it was invested in the, in the right way in infrastructure. It's only money. It's just giving them away so they can buy, purchase necessary products for infrastructure and manufacturing. And it, would, it wouldn't even measure. It wouldn't even be a blip on our federal budget. I mean, what, what is $5 billion? What is $10 billion? What is $100 billion? All these congressmen get all worked up over it. It's spent within nanoseconds every day of a budget. Why not use it for something productive? But that's, a, that's probably too radical to propose. So I have to keep, because if I ever told anybody in the United States we should give it away, they'd go crazy. But you could have, you could have grants. You could have a grant for Transaqua. You could have a grant for East West Railroad. This can be done. It's only money. Okay. It's actually not money. It's just credit. Okay. And we're going to make the uh, the Hamilton reports on credit banking, uh, manufacturers, and the Mint available as well uh, in the email that will go out to inform people of this class uh, when it's up on our YouTube channel. Um, so far, I have six questions in queue. The next one in line is uh, Scott, then we have Nick, then Harrison, then Alex, then Pip. So, Scott, you have a question? Scott, you are on mute. Scott's turned his camera upside down. Oh, there he is. Scott's whole house is spinning around. <laughs> He's in a hurricane. Okay. Scott, can uh... Is he muted? Let me see. No, he's off mute. No, he, but he's off. His video's not working. His video's not working. Um... The video's not a big deal, but it's a question of can we hear you. No, Scott, yeah. we cannot hear you. We can see you now. Uh, alas, how about uh, I'll call upon uh, Nick while Scott is uh, fiddling around, okay? And uh, we'll get back to you, Scott. So, Nick, you're up. Hey, hey, Larry, thanks for that. That was like, uh, yeah, it's brilliant. Uh, I, was, I was gripped all the way through. I'd just like to ask, um, what country on the African continent right now do you think is the closest to that um, Alexander Hamiltonian bank? Well, or, or that kind of policy in terms of, of, you know, general policy towards development? Well, the Ethiopians uh, had really been, move, been moving in that direction now. They, they were, and the reason for it is there was, um, well, the whole history of Ethiopia, as I said, is kind of interesting and unique. But their uh, former prime minister, who died prematurely in uh, I'm thinking around 2012, his name was Melis Zenawi. And he was an interesting intellectual uh, in economics on the continent. And he developed this notion called the developmental state. And he attacked the Hobbesian notion, which he called the night watchman. He said, look, the state is not there to protect people and protect their contracts and their property. The state should nurture development. And, it, and um, he called, he attacked what was the, what is called neoliberalism and promoted the nation, the notion that the state should be a, an active force in economic growth, which is absolutely true. I mean, in fact, every state in the history of the world, going back to France, uh, uh, Colbert, all the way up to China today, any country that's developed has always developed with the assistance of the state. The idea of free trade, laissez-faire, laissez-faire, is nonsense. Never, it never happened. Even the British, when they developed, 
use the nation state to develop. They use the vehicles of the state. Yeah, it's free trade for the British, but not for yeah. anybody. So the Mellis had this idea. In 2000, 2001, he split his party, the party that overthrew the dirge in 1991, the Ethiopian Revolutionary Democratic Policy Front. And he split the party on this question. He said, we're not going to go Marxist, because a lot of them might be Marxist, and we're not going to go free trade. We're going to go with the my conception. Yeah. And he split the party down the middle. I think he won, his faction won by one or two votes. So from 2000, 2001, Ethiopia pursued a derogistic Hamiltonian policy. Whether they called it that, I don't know, because uh, Melis Zenaway and I never met, but all the people knew the two of us said, you guys got to meet, and it never happened. But I met many of his students, and uh, they, they look, Ethiopia is one of the poorest countries in Africa. 110 million people. I mean, I've seen poverty there. It's extraordinary. Yet, they built the first electrified East-West Railroad. They are building the largest dam on the continent. There's a beautiful metro in Addis Ababa. I've, I saw when it was built, and then I came back after it was built. They built roads. They have. I've, I wrote a, uh, maybe a 7,000-word article analyzing their development over many years. They had it. Yeah, now, they're, they're under... They're, being, they're having difficulties now. There's no question about it. But they had this approach. Whether they know what it was Hamilton or American system, I don't know. But it was identical. So I would say in terms of the whole content of all the people I've met, they moved in uh, a self-conscious, thoughtful direction on development. They, they took money out of the capital budget for transportation. They had pro-development. They called them pro-growth policies and pro-growth development banks. In the mission statement of the bank, it says we are pro-growth. So they, this was there. Uh, Nigeria, I think the president has good ideas. I don't think he has yeah. knowledge of this, and I don't think he has enough backing. I did meet some people in Cote d'Ivoire that had a very good understanding. Uh, we'll see if this continues, because they just elected the president again. Uh, Watara was reelected in October. That's what I was there for. Some of his people have an understanding, a good understanding, and a lot of them I've been meeting with, trying to educate them on Hamilton. Uh, those two countries are sort of interesting to me right now. There may be others, but uh, there definitely is an interest in this discussion um, for Hamilton's policies. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me just refer quickly back to uh, Scott to see if he, no, I guess he has logged off to try to fix his thing. Um, all right, so next up we have uh, Harrison on the uh, the queue. So Harrison, you're, you're up. Can I be heard? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I have a question uh, that um, is an add-on to an earlier question. I forgot I'm horrible in the names. Um, and you talked about uh, Mr. Freeman, I think you talked about the idea of Americans just giving cr lines of credit to those African countries for develop for all these projects and development. American, I'm talking about the government creating a credit. government of American, yeah, the government of America, um, you know, um, issuing credit to these African countries. Um, and um, from what you told me, when you when you would talk to a, an average American about that, they they go crazy, like they think that's a, like, a, like a pipe dream. Would that tie into the ideological reasons you've mentioned earlier on why Americans think that way and why our government is very reluctant or or, or even completely against this, this idea? Well, uh, I've been involved in politics since I was uh, 17 years old, and now I'm going to be 70 soon. And I've watched the political process in this country deteriorate over many, many years. We have been shrinking in our outlook, probably since the assassination of Kennedy in 1963. We used to be better than this. We used to think about the world. We used to think about both. Look at Kennedy. The first head of state he invites is Kwame Nkrumah. I mean, that is a mind blower for me. And But since then, we've gotten small. We've lost our vision. Occasionally, someone will come up with an idea. But we don't think like Americans, like we used to think, they even under the Roosevelt period. I mean, look what Roosevelt did. He was creating money out of thin air all the time. 
through the reconstruction finance company. I forgot the final figure it was either 35 or $40 billion was put through the ROC. Where did that come from? It came from government. The idea that the government can through public credit do good is something that we've lost. So we've got stupid Republicans and we've got stupid Democrats and they think money is something other than what it is. It's merely a means to do good and credit does, is in, it's in the US Constitution that you can create credit. That's what debt is. Debt for production, debt for the future. And that debt gets paid back by the productivity that it creates in that economic investment that the debt has been targeted for. This is well known. This goes all the way back probably to 17th century France with uh, Colbert. But we've lost that conception this, we, we've, we've lost something about ourselves. I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm an American, I love America, but I love really the principles we were founded on. I'm not really so happy with what's going on today. And of course, the, the Democrats are always intent on just shooting themselves in the head anytime they can. Rather than taking advantage, they have the upper hand right now to do some good, they're gonna go in a completely different direction for the next 10 days. We have lost who we are, in the words of Tony Jacob, we've lost who we are, and and we've got to get it back. We need some leadership and ideas to rediscover what the United States is, because our policy towards Africa is just typical of bad policy all, all, everywhere. We're not helping develop anybody in the world right now. We're not developing ourselves. Therefore, we need a, a change in thinking to make this work. And how that comes about, I'm not exactly sure, but the more people of goodwill who are promoting this, the better chances we have. But the problem is philosophical, not monetary, the problems that we have towards the development of Africa. Okay. Um, <clears throat> next on the list, we have Alex. Hello. Um, hello, Larry. Thank you for your presentation. I, I appreciate all the work you've done um, advocating on behalf of Africa. Um, yeah, I had, I was, um, you know, living in the DC area, you know, you, you, it's a big hub for Ethiopian population. So um, one of the, and I have gotten my, you know, I've been volunteering in the community and I'm, on the board of a, of a new organization that helps Ethiopian refugees okay. adjust. And one of the things that they want to branch out into branch out to is research and policy proposals to help Ethiopia. And um, so one of my, uh, one of my questions is, you know, if you were in charge, given the conflicts that are happening now, what are three or four things you would do uh, at, in to uh, stabilize the situation and move forward? And uh, maybe a related question uh, is, um, you know, being <laughs> over the last years, I mean, you know, uh, a lot, uh, most, of, most of my friends are in the African community, whether they're Ethiopian or Cameroonian, like a couple of my friends are on the call today. And one of the things I hear uh, often is complaints about China's presence in, in, in Africa. Um, now I know, <laughs> you know, I have my own ideas about that. I think most of it is BS. Um, now, the question is, what is your, what is, uh, in, your, in your view, are there any problems with the way that the Chinese are conducting themselves in Africa? Um, and uh, I'll leave it at that. And if, and if we can, you know, if you have any time, I would love to continue some of the, some of the discussion on Ethiopia with you offline if you have time in the coming weeks. Well, the, 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 the China question is really very simple. The, the Chinese, no, no, nobody is perfect. Uh, the Chinese have actually improved their relationship, but there are a plethora of reports by people in the private sector. Um, Mackenzie put out a report. They show that what is being said about China in Africa is untrue. It is, there is no colonialism. This is not, they're not even thinking in that direction. The whole history 
of relations to China and Africa is between under the two underdeveloped continents, and one has made progress. The idea that they were bringing over Chinese labor, it's untrue. They, the reports exist, they're all on my website. Uh, the majority of all the firms doing business in, in Africa, Chinese firms, are hiring African labor, 80 to 90%. The other idea that they were seizing control of countries or assets when they didn't pay the loans, there's a great website, uh, Cary Africa Research Institute of John Hopkins, uh, Deborah Bartengown. I don't agree with everything she says, but her, she has the greatest data collection of any. De Deborah what? Her name is Bartengown, but the institute is Cary, C-A-R-I, from John Hopkins, uh, from SAIS, School of International, Advanced International Study, John Hopkins. Mm. And they have the best database, and they put out reports every few months. Not one project has been seized in Africa. In fact, only one project out of all the projects has even partially been seized. No country has been taking control. China is not the major debtor. It is 17% of the debt. The IMF private sector are larger controllers of the debt. I mean, this is basic facts, but people get whipped up. Africans get whipped up too. I mean, I've had people denounce me because I won't go along with this. But I can't go along with something that's wrong. So the whole clamor from the West is geopolitical inspired propaganda. There is no truth to it. Is there, can the Chinese do better? For, frankly, I, I would like to, I think the Chinese are moving too slow. We need energy in Africa. And if I had control of anything, I would be building hydroelectric plants in every river I could get my hands on. We need energy. And without the energy, you're basically a, a bullshit artist about Africa. You don't really give a damn about anything if you're not going to build energy, if you're not going to build railroads. You're just wasting the words out of your mouth are, be, are wasting, you're just using up precious oxygen. Because, and that's what my gripe with the human rights organizations are. They won't fight for development. And, and therefore, this is, China is doing nothing wrong. They could be doing better but they're doing nothing wrong. Now, Ethiopia, this is a big, big problem because the, Mel the Mellis tendency in Ethiopia was profound and it was correct, even though the two of us never talked. I he only had two things published in English. Everything else was in Aramic. And I can, I can barely even remember English, so I wasn't gonna study Aramic. <laughs> but um, one of them is published in a book by, um, which I can give people the name of, you contact me on global development. And he's very explicit on these policies of the nation state's involvement in development. Uh, he had around him a group of people who I met with when I went to Ethiopia a couple of times, and they understood it. Now there's pressure coming in on Ethiopia because of his debt overexposure, and they're trying to push certain policies in, and the government is trying to maneuver its way through. And I, I, there's all on my website, all the articles on this. So they're on difficult conditions. And Ahmed, uh, Dr. Abi Ahmed, he did something that was very courageous. He took on ethno-nationalism because Nigeria's constitution is poor. I've criticized it, but it's poor because it recognizes multiple peoples mm. in Ethiopia. It doesn't recognize the Ethiopian people as one. So you have various regions of Ethiopia controlled by one ethno-nationalist group. And that's not a basis of having a nation state. You can't have a nation state if you have competing ethno groups. But you have the same thing in Nigeria, but not formalized, where Igbos are Igbos first before they're Nigerians. Therefore, he upset the apple cart and he proposed a prosperity party, which would be an Ethiopian-based party. And the Tigrayans went nuts and other people. And there's all kinds of outside operations, some of them coming from the United States. So it's a very tough situation. They're trying to do the right thing. They really are, and I support them and I anything I can to help them. But it, it, they have to get through, they have to reestablish a national identity to Ethiopia, and they have to con continue the policies of development. I mean, this what they've done, the Ethiopian Renaissance Stand is remarkable. They funded this dam by themselves. 
$5 billion from Ethiopians in the United States and in Ethiopia. They only would sell bonds to Ethiopians. Members who work for the government gave part of their paycheck to fund this dam. So this is a wonderful idea of national identity. And the, the Egyptians or anybody else who thinks they're gonna stop this dam, they have no idea what, what, that that will never happen. And Trump's involvement was just silly. He doesn't understand Africa at all, but the Ethiopians, this, ident this dam is like the Adwa victory. <laughs> this is, they're not gonna let go of this thing. And it's good, 6,200 megawatts, and they'll be selling power to the neighboring countries. Now, 6,000 megawatts is nothing. I would like to see 60,000, but it's a start. And uh, they, 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 they're on the right track, but they're in a very difficult period right now. They could use all the support. And they did actually get, believe it or not, the uh, State Department, the Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, did support Ethiopia uh, in supporting the, the um, Prime Minister in his fight in Tigray. Now, what's going to happen in the next administration, I have no idea. There's a lot of bad people coming in here from liberal networks from Clinton and Obama. Uh, and I, I, don't, I don't have a good feeling that they're going to do the right thing. Susan Rice is also say, is already saying the wrong things, uh, as you as you would expect. Yes, <laughs> Susan Rice is, and uh, is it? See, the Trump administration was just split because you had all these neocons like um, Bolton and Pompeo, and then you had the mother traditionalists. So you got conflicting messages came out of the same government, which is often the case. And then Trump himself had no idea what was going on. I mean, the fact that he picked Peter Mnuchin to be the negotiated between Egypt and, and uh, Ethiopia was pretty, I know how that happened, it was pretty funny. So Ethiopia is trying to do the right thing. Uh, we gotta build infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. That's my, that's my model, I'm not like a real estate agent. Location, location, location. Re infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. And if well, countries really care, they would help, assist, credit and other technical capabilities in building this infrastructure. Well, thank you, Larry. I don't want to um, hog up everybody else's time, but I'll see if I'll send you a message over the next okay. couple of weeks. And no um, thank you again. Okay. It's a great question, uh, Alex. And yeah, the, the um, I recently wrote an article <clears throat> on the, uh, the spirit of Cecil Rhodes, which is unfortunately <laughs> very strong in the Biden cabinet. There's five already uh, who are very strong, in, strongly placed, Pete, Pete Buttigieg being one of them, um, which is, it, it's, it's an ill foreboding, uh, unfortunately. Not, not to say it's a hopeless cause, but there's a, yeah, the, the spirit of Rhodes is unfortunately not as dead as his body. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, we have Pip, I believe, who is, had a question. I'm not too sure if I interpreted that correctly. Pip, did I? Yes, you did. Yeah. Um, Go ahead, I, my friend. Hello, <clears throat> hello Lawrence. Um, if I understand um, the Hamiltonian credit system correctly, it, and that you need a vehicle, so you need a body from which to issue the, the credit, then um, what if... Um, I've got four things here just to throw out. What if the Exim Bank of Africa, now with the free trade agreement, um, the Exim Bank is going to take center stage? Could that be a vehicle? Um, the, the second one is the African Development Bank itself. Could that be a vehicle? Could um, another vehicle be formed by... Um, the African High Speed Railway Network? Could, could we form some kind of infrastructure vehicle? And then the, the last idea, and, and just bringing into what you mentioned already, um, in Egypt um, and, and with GERD, the selling of national bonds, because that was how they funded the, the new Suez Canal. Um, but the uh, fourth thing, what about packaging the entirety of Africa's debt and using that as your vehicle to issue the credit? 
So all the debt that Africa really does not owe the IMF, why not turn that into a, um, a credit base and say, okay, this money will now all go into um, building energy and building infrastructure? Uh, well, those are really interesting ideas. Does, let me ask you a question. Does Africa actually have an Exim Bank? Yes, it does. I think it, I've got to, mm -hmm. I've got to clarify on this, but I think it might be new um, with, with, uh, with the Continental Free Trade Agreement. Oh, okay. Because I, I know the, the African Development Bank exists. Actually, it's in, um, it's in Abidjan, uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, the idea is that government, until we set up an international institution, like a new Bretton Woods, then you're basically subject to country to country credit relations. The United States is explicit in its constitution that it can create credit. That's part of the constitution, that debt can be created. I mean, it, yes, China is obviously explicit. Any country can really do it. As I said, the problem that African countries have is because of their weak economies, then their credit wouldn't be accepted. Therefore, the Egyptians and around the Suez Canal expansion and the Ethiopians got around this by funding it themselves, which you could do for a project. I don't think the populations are wealthy enough that you could continue to do this. Now, you have various governments now are in the business of selling euro bonds. And it's not a bad idea, except what is the money from the bond being used for? You really want to tie this directly to a project. That's why you get the French, the French word dirigism. Uh, is that's what you're looking to do? Is that the credit is directed towards a project that would lead to the increased production of wealth and increase the productive powers of that society? Now, uh, government to government credit can be used prior to setting up a an, in, an instant international institution. That's what the Chinese are doing. It, that's exactly what they're doing. Governments, it goes through the banks, but the banks are backed up by the country, by the, by the government. We could do that in the United States in the, in the short term, but you have to have, there's a difference between setting up an authority to administer the credit and the issuance of credit. The issuance of credit has to come from a entity, a nation, or a combination of nations that are putting up their, the wealth of their economy as a basis for issuing the credit. Mm -hmm. That's what Bretton Woods was designed by Roosevelt and Hexter, uh, Dexter White, Harry Dexter White really designed. So in Africa, you have, you could set up an authority to receive the credit. So you can set up a railroad authority. I often thought we could have set up the East-West Railroad Authority in Nigeria to build the East-West Railroad. So the credit goes into this authority and the authority has a semi-autonomous relationship to disperse the credit for the project. This is what was known as the Tennessee Valley Authority. It's a very interesting story. I just wrote a book on the Tennessee Valley Authority. This is what they did and they did it very well. They took money that came in from bonds and, and from the government and dispersed it with a freedom to do as they thought best for the common good of the Tennessee Valley of nation, uh, country, uh, states. So you, we could set up authorities to do this, but to, they have to have a line of credit that is acceptable. Hmm. So then when you're paying a contractor, which is you're going to be using the private sector, you're paying a contractor that the bank accepts that line of credit and therefore will issue the payment to the workers or to the buying of materials or something else. That's where the African countries come uh, weak in. And therefore, that's where they need the backup. So countries could back them up and certify or, or, or ensure their credit lines. But we're not doing that. With the all the American administrations have done, and Trump just did it in a, he created a new vehicle. They are giving insurance to the private sector to make the loans to Africa. But that's really not the way it should work. We should be insuring the African countries credit that they could extend themselves because the private sector is just never going to accomplish the task of what has to be done. They can be involved in it. So your suggestions of you know, now the, the African bank 
does lend money to Africa. I don't think it's capitalized sufficiently to lend the kinds of money necessary, but they, they do lend money for infrastructure projects. It's just not a lot. And in the uh, Transaqua project that was passed, uh, the Transaqua proposal that was passed at the Abuja conference, they actually specified that $50 billion would be raised in the African Development Bank for Transaqua. They had now, so I think the African Development, I'm not familiar with the Exxon Bank at all. Maybe this is a new feature of the free trade agreement, but the African Development Bank could work, but it would have to be capitalized. So how would you capitalize it? Well, the same way we capitalized the banks in Germany after the war, you, uh, buy a certain amount of capital of the bank. You increase the capital bank by purchasing stocks of the bank or bonds of the bank. And that expands the base of which the capital can then be, uh, the more capital you have, the more loans you can make. This was done also in the reconstruction finance company when the capital would be purchased by the reconstruction finance company of the banks. So the banks could lend more money. This is one of the brilliant things that Jesse Jones did. He didn't buy stocks. He wasn't trying to make money on the stock exchange. He, he expanded the capital base of American banks that weren't lending for the recovery on the Roosevelt. So he gave them money essentially to spend. And the United States could purchase capital stock of the African Development Bank and expand the base of it. That's a, I mean, I hadn't thought about it. It's not a bad idea. But it, unless it was supported, it doesn't have enough capital on its own to make the kind of loans. I mean, I mean, Transaqua is, could be $80 billion, $60, 60 billion, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, the Grand Inca is probably $80 billion, $40 billion to build a dam, $40 billion to build the transmission lines. Now, that's not a lot of money for the West. But it's, 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 it, there's no African country that has good enough credit in its economy that it can create that credit by itself. Now, Bahari has created a lot of debt in Nigeria to build these railroads. I think it's good because if you don't have those railroads in Nigeria, you can't move around this country, which is a very, very populated country. And roads are really not going to cut it in Africa as we went through earlier. Mm. So debt has to be created one way or the other, but it's not a problem if the debt is geared towards future increase of wealth through infrastructure and manufacturing and increasing labor productivity. And having the right institution to issue the debt is, has to have enough backing and security and support to be able to do that. I like your idea of the African Development Bank. That's I have to look at their charter and look at everything they're doing. But this is what some of the development banks in Ethiopia were doing. They actually have a bank called the Development Bank in Ethiopia. Hmm. It's actually, that's the name of it. And it's, it issues money. And in mission, it says we issue money for growth pro-growth policies. So it can be done, but it, Africa needs international help and support right now. Can't do it by itself. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Nick just sent me a quick message saying that he has a thought based on what you were just saying that he'd like to uh, just add to the, the quick discussion here. Uh, Nick? Thanks. No, yeah, I just wanted to add, like, um, I collect a lot of, like, uh, data and research on the different infrastructure being built in Africa and who it's being done by. So if, if anybody wants those spreadsheets, just contact me after and I can send you them. Oh yeah, those, those are great spreadsheets. Thanks, yeah. Larry. I'm going to also look into your request regarding road density and things like this. But um, I just wanted to kind of add to that, like put my two cents, two cents in there. And I think it can be done on like, uh, you know, continental level as well as regional, as well as uh, national. Uh, regarding infrastructure development and of course with the helping hand from China in the form that credit is being uh, distributed across the African continent right now they could go on to use that infrastructure to secure uh, extra credit being uh, you know diversified and, and sent out into the nation so they can actually use the development of those national resources that they're going to go about doing now with Chinese loans and later on convert that into their own uh, credit. But I also wanted to get at what Alex asked before regarding uh, America and its position, uh, its ideological position, like regarding Africa is that first I'd like to ask, I mean, if 
the West has so much of a problem with what China is doing in Africa, then why don't they just compete directly with it? Of course. Right? I mean, right. If, you really, if you really want to go toe to toe, just go toe to toe and literally, instead of try, you know, instead of employing journalists worldwide to write slanderous articles about what China's actually doing on the ground in physical reality, um, why don't America just directly compete with them? It's a, it's a simple one. Well, but you see the problem, well, I want to go back to one thing Pip said, but on your point, the, the problem, Nicholas, is you have a way of thinking. And the best phrase, term I have for it is geopolitical doctrine, which was the, the, goes all the way back to the British, the British East India Company. If you're thinking that the world is not an expanding living creature of wealth creation by human beings, and the, then your opposite point of view is the world is fixed and finite and therefore there's only winners and losers. So you have to be like Cecil Rose and have your foot on the head of your natives to steal their wealth because you can't think of creating wealth. So the problem is the geopolitical thinking is the problem. Mm -hmm. Of course they can go toe to toe. You know, they can go toe to toe. Yeah. And yeah, the, Africans, the Africans have asked them. They said, please come compete with China. Yeah. It won't do it because of an ideological thinking shortcoming. It's not, the, it's not simply designing the right policies. It's the policies will have no absorption if the mind is not even thinking in terms of the potential of the human race and the planet we live on to develop wealth for centuries to come. So the problem is, yeah, we could go toe to toe. We won't until we change the geopolitical thinking and get someone like John Kennedy back in there. Yeah. I mean, Larry, I, I want to draw on that point too. Like there, there is a specific example. Um, the Trump administration did actually manage to fund one major infrastructure development on the African continent in Mozambique. Mm -hmm. And they gave a four and a half billion dollar loan. Really? Yep, for, mm -hmm. for liquid natural gas development. There's a huge offshore liquid natural gas right. Uh, deposit in Mozambique. It's worth about, right now they're saying around 30 billion is going to have to be poured in to actually uh, channel that resource. But uh, right now around seven countries are actually involved in this, including Korea, India, Japan, China, USA, uh, hmm. Germany, I think as well. And yeah, it's going to require at least 10 countries to get it off the ground. Well, so, can I well, jump in real quick? Sorry, just one second. And and that, that proposal that was put forth, what they've been accusing China of is using Chinese workers to build infrastructure in Africa, which is completely not true. And anybody who wants to see that can check my spreadsheets. And I have specific numbers on a lot of those projects and how many workers are being used nationally and internationally to build those things. But all that was ever said from the, from the Trump administration after signing that deal all they ever spoke about was the fact that 16,700 American workers were going to get jobs from signing that deal. And there was no mention of any Mozambican jobs being provided. There was no mention of any national uh, technology transfer, any training for locals on the ground, any grants for universities. Now, you see, it's not just China building infrastructure. It's not just a A to B here. China builds schools. They build accessory roads. They offer grants to around 18,000 African students yearly. So this, this is not just uh, concrete. Mm -hmm. I, this is a difference in ideology, as Larry was just saying. It, it's a complete difference in ideology. And China is closer to the Hamiltonian ideology than America is in practice on an international platform. Uh, Pip, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to say... And in response to finding all that uh, natural gas, and I think the American company there was Anadarko, and uh, in response to that, there's uh, the, the 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 region's been swamped by militants. So um, there's a horrendous mm. situation. There's hundreds of people have died. Um, mm. the, the militants have taken control of. Um, Cabo, um, can't, can't remember the name. Um, one of one of the key northern towns. So that's uh, you know, that's the 
other side of um, mm -hmm. when there's good news, that's what happens. Well, one thing is that the profile of the now, uh, Nick, that you're saying that came from the Trump administration. So, you, are you saying that's a government-sponsored deal, or the government is supporting uh, the private sector? It was certainly a government initiative. It was a whole-of-government approach to financing infrastructure in Africa. Because the, the profile of the West prior to the Chinese uh, it has been in the oil and gas sector. I mean, that's what they're focused on, not infrastructure connectivity, which is what the Chinese have brought into the picture. The other thing, Pitt, I didn't answer you on this question on the national, take the national debt of all the African countries. That's a really complicated task. I mean, you could do that. Hamilton did that in the United States. He took the total debt and absorbed it in the federal government and then took a loan to pay off the debt. But that was a coherent country and the debt was knowable. The problem with the African debt is you'd have to figure out what is valid, what is unvalid, what I would suggest is we just have a debt moratorium that we don't repudiate right now because that would raise even more hackles. We just have a debt moratorium and issue new credit specifically designed for uh, these infrastructure projects. So we have a project oriented derogistic new creation of credit and we'll put everything else on hold while it's going on because that, that takes a lot of work to absorb all the debt of 55 countries. And I'm, I'm sure beyond my capabilities to figure it all out. So mm -hmm. why don't we just put in debt moratorium and issue new credit? That, and that I mean, be... I think on, on that point, Christina Fernandez de Kirchner many years ago made a very good point uh, regarding Argentina's debt repayments to the IMF over the course of decades. And she made the point that if you actually look at the loans that we were given, the original, the original loans, we've paid them back already 10 to 20 times uh, over and yet we still are drowning in unpayable debts that are growing at an accelerating rate. So I'm sure that those same figures are going to be found again and again, uh, even more uh, pronounced across Africa as well. So if we took that sort of audit uh, of Africa in an honest way and looked at, well, what have they already paid back over the past 50, 50 years? We'd probably find that it's just to say that they've paid off their debts <laughs> and whatever else they owe at this point is not legitimate. Um, so yeah, this new Hamiltonian credit that would be generated, that's, that's a really great thought experiment to think how that would then operate by being branched out through both international banking uh, organizations as well as local national banks as well. It, it's a really interesting uh, challenge for young economists to really, really think this through. Um, yeah, that's very good. I had one last question. Uh, Scott was not able to unfortunately get on due to some technical glitch, uh, Vancouver weather or something. So uh, he did basically message me his, uh, his idea, uh, which I'm going to just sort of merge with a question I had <clears throat> and make a hybrid out of it. Um, did, did, did Joanna, did Joanna, do you have another question? Oh. Okay. I, I, I couldn't tell. Joanna, you're, you're on mute. Did you have something? Oh, my hand's waving. Great. You can hear me now? Yeah. Very good. Uh, I just had a little question. You know, we have these um, blue funds green bonds, you know, smaller ways. Uh, I haven't seen all of Africa take up things like that, but, you know, I like the thought experiment of, of what could be done with a moratorium on, moratorium on debt, but I, I can't imagine the different institutions that are part of the debt as it stands now, lining up to say, yes, <laughs> we bequeath it to you let's start fresh 2021 you know here we go uh and so uh what is the what is the um compromise between something like that you know i i think that much of the world is very open-minded at this point considering this last year uh and you know how how to build how to keep the momentum for all the different parts of progress and security you know, with with the oh. with the hangups, but so I I don't uh, I don't know that that would really be possible to just uh, start fresh on the debt. But you know, do do you see application of these kinds of creative financing um, um, I don't know. Uh, I guess I really don't have a question. I'm just wondering if you've if you've seen uh, you know the, any success in those you know especially since Nigeria has more has said more about the green bonds. 
Well, the, the main problem is, is the, uh, you have to have a conception of what you're creating the debt for. Mm. I mean, in my view, I mean, Africa has no, I'm, I'm not even, I'm not convinced of the view that CO2 is even a problem, but Africa has no problem. The CO2 release in Africa is so minuscule compared to the rest of the world, it's not even worth considering. Mm -hmm. and, and I've read some World Bank statistics on CO2 production. It's, it's hard to even measure it. But the, main, the other problem is the, we want to really advocate transformative projects, big projects that require a lot of money, a lot of credit, not money. And that's the way to transform the continent. I'm interested in transforming the continent. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, a, you could have a debt moratorium. Look, right now we have a debt suspension until because of COVID, everybody has agreed not to force the collection of debt until June of this 2021. Mm -hmm. So there already is a debt suspension. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't we carry a debt suspension first? By saying debt moratorium, we're not repudiating the debt. That would be debt cancellation. Mm. So let's not say debt cancellation because we know everyone will get all worked up over that. Uh, even though three hundred billion dollars debt cancellation is not a big deal for me, but it would be for people in, in government. So why don't we say debt moratorium? So we're not repudiating it, and we have a moratorium, and we then say now we're going to have a new policy for. Uh, uh, infrastructure, and let's come up. What I would like with the African, if the aid, the aid, the the African Free Trade Agreement has a, interesting ideas, but if it doesn't handle the question of infrastructure, power, roads, and rail, it's not, it's not going to work, because that's what trade does not produce wealth. It does, right. Trade is part of a running economy, but doesn't produce wealth. The AFCTA has to work on that, but. The AU could come up with a list of 10 transformative projects for the continent. I can think of three, East West Railroad, North South Railroad, Transaco right away. And they say, okay, these are the list of projects we would like our friends in the rest of the world to help us build and fund. Now that could be done. And these, in other words, if there's the will and the mind, the mindset to do these things, vehicles can always be found to do it. The question is the mindset. It's metaphysical, not physical. And uh, Chinese have figured it out from, from dealing with their own country. I mean, this, this is so undeniable that the West should be ashamed of itself because China has taken more people off poverty than have ever been I mean any any time previous in the history of capitalism, they were lifted 750 million. In fact, the total that's if you look at the reduction in poverty, because I mentioned to you that Africa was the only country continent growing in poverty, there's been a massive net reduction. 80 to 90 percent of it is due to China, because and using the same figures of a dollar ninety a day, which the World Bank has accepted. Mm. Therefore, you would say to yourself, well, gee, if I want to eliminate poverty. I might want to find out what they're doing. Now, China's pledged to eliminate poverty in, in Africa, which would be half, 400 million or 440 million, I think the figure I gave you. Therefore, we know it can be done. And how did they do it? They did it by building railroads where people didn't exist. And after they got done with the railroad, they did exist. And industry did come to it. And electrical power lines were presented to these uh, nodal points that could be built up, like Banki in Central Africa, like uh, all these places where there are nexus points for development, could be nexus points for development. Uh, you know, obviously Kinshasa in the Congo, these things can be done. So it's not simply a vehicle, it's, it's a mindset. And we just, we have, we're not there in, in the West, but uh, you can't argue with what's been done, it works. And it's always worked. Throughout 300 years of history, it's always worked. Derogistic credit works, always. And we built this country on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well Just said. to add, China does do debt forgiveness. 
they uh, have forgiven ten billion billion dollars of African debt since the year. They before. forgave the they forgave the uh, debt that was issued by the government of China. They're still keeping on the books the money from the Exim Bank and uh, the other bank they use. But Larry, did you hear about the the MOU they signed? I think with Botswana just five days ago. There was debt forgiveness in this. Uh, oh yeah, no, I just I only heard about the deal with MOU with DRC. Because I got it sent to me by Pip. Because <laughs> right now I'm spending, I'm spending my entire day and night writing projects for countries, and I don't even keep up with what's going on. Right. Well, yeah, Botswana also did one like oh, uh, okay. two days prior. Yeah. All right, Pip. You now, have to, you have to now, put it on your website. Yeah, there's only five left now, I think, on the continent that haven't signed up to the BRI. So. Oh, right, right, with the BRI. So, Matthew, you had your question from your friend and yourself. Yep. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I suppose, Nick, you won't mind if I just share your two excellent ex uh, Excel sheets with everybody, right? Of course. Go ahead. Fantastic. Yeah. And I think, I think just as a thought that, that arose as you were, I was listening to you speak, um, Larry, was just that, you know, that you, economics properly understood, I think, from the Dirish standpoint, has a lot in common with a, a proper competent gardener. You know, and you, 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 when you plant a seed in the, in the soil, you don't just expect to be able to, to just extract some sort of food and, and riches in the moment. You, you have to, uh, a sense of waiting for future p potential to arise by creating a fertile climate and taking care of it and, and watering it and giving it sunlight um, and other nutrients. And it's like we have been using uh, a, an ideological modus operandi for many, many decades under the IMF, the World Bank, that has really completely just ignored the reality of how potential really does flourish and how do you do real wealth creation qualitatively um and we're just letting all of these seeds just sit in the in the dry soil um and and thinking that somehow we could just squeeze <laughs> squeeze somehow wealth out of it and it's just insane whereas when you look at a much more competent provably functional way of doing things the way the rfc worked in the new deal or the way that uh, any type of progress ever happened in a, in a higher way under Hamiltonian pol policies or uh, dirigistic policies from Colbert. Uh, it was always a totally different understanding that wealth is something which you, you, you can't force it. You, you have to just create a climate and opportunities for passion, for hope, for intellectual development of the minds. And the, of course, the bodies of people is, is vital. You know, if you're starving, you're not gonna have those other two higher functions develop. And, you know, you, you have a plan and you don't know what it's going to look like mathematically, but you have faith that it will take a natural good form and it, it works every single time we do it that way. Um, which sort of leads into my actual question, um, with, uh, which was the hybrid question with Scott's. Um, <clears throat> on the one hand, uh, so Scott was wondering about the, the dissonance between Egypt and uh, Ethiopia and, and some of the, the problems of the Ethiopian uh, Renaissance Dam uh, being built as fast as it should have been based on disputes over diminishing water with, or, you know, around uh, Egypt. And there's an irony in that because both countries have in many ways activated um, a sacrilege. If you were a, a, an IMF economist, you, you know, you might, uh, you, you will tend to attack both um, activities of the, the use of development bonds that uh, doubled the size of the Suez Canal as well as the, you know, by having the population of Egypt invest in these bonds that were tied to this big project, which was very much uh, a Hamiltonian idea um, that Lincoln even uh, adopted in the construction of the transcontinental railway, but also you had the same thing done as you went through in, in Ethiopia. And yet in spite of that fact, both of them are, are bickering in a very dangerous way. And why, why is it when they're, they're so in harmony as far as their interests are concerned and even their, the means to achieve their ends, why is it that we find such um dispute going on well, let's do with the history of these countries you have to remember that again egypt was under egypt uh british control i think nasser freed it i think in 1952 mm. from right abdul nasser but they have been under british control for the 1800s and then 1900s and egypt was given the response the response was given the assignment by the British to control Sudan, which didn't go well for um, for Chinese Gorni. He lost his head over it. But uh, the history of the, the Egyptians is they believe they have some legacy of colonial rights to the Nile. 
which was given to him by the queen at the turn of the century, I think 1900, uh, is a letter on this question where the queen, I think it's Victoria, grants them the rights of control of the Nile. 1929, when Egypt and Sudan are both under control of the British, they have a water agreement. And the water agreement allows Egypt 74% of the water and Sudan 19 or 20% of the water. Ethiopia is not at the agreement. And Ethiopia is a free country. Ethiopia is the only African country that went to the Bretton Woods Conference because they, they were a free country. Then they have another water agreement in 1959 where Egypt and Sudan are both free at this point. Uh, Sudan became independent in 56. And they have the same water agreement, but this time they're free. They're not under British control. And they have the same water agreement with the same stipulations, which say that there can be no dam built on the Nile without the approval of the British. So there's a modern problem with the Egyptians thinking that the Nile belongs to them. There's actually nine or 10 countries around the Nile. Plus the Blue Nile comes in from Ethiopia, from Lake Tana. So it's not even uh, part of Sudan or Egypt or anything else. It's a separate river that is 85% of the Nile, north of Khartoum. The Egyptians are, unfortunately, they have this development side that you correctly said, and it's been written about quite a bit on development, but they have a problem where they've been, they've still, their mind is still inculcated, inculcated with uh, colonial thinking. They, really, they don't have any legacy. Now, the Sudanese should work it out. The question is the fill rate. It's, the dam is built and it's gonna be built. I mean, it's 75% done. The question is how much water is taken out of the Nile from the blue Nile that reduces the rate of water that the Egyptians feel they need going up to the Aswad Nam. That's a scientific engineering question. It depends on the rainfall, it depends on a lot of factors. You have to negotiate that and you have to figure it out, but you can't categorically say you can't build this dam unless we get so much water because the Sudanese, uh, the Ethiopians are not responsible for delivering a certain amount of water to the Aswan Dam. They are responsible for working it out in a common development perspective. And that's the only way to approach it. And the, uh, the Ethiopians have sovereignty on their side because the river, the dam they built, the Sudanese could have built this dam if they had any brains, but the Ethiopians built it, it's like 30 meters from the Sudanese border. And they're just taking this water that's flowing out and they're building a dam there. And uh, it's producing 6,200 megawatts of power, which will be sold to the entire region. Sudan, Kenya's already uh, made uh, contracts for it. So it's a question of what is the best development for Africa? There shouldn't be a confrontation. There absolutely should not be. Africa doesn't need any more confrontation. And I think the Egyptians are reflecting poor thinking in the way they're demanding these rights on the Nile. They don't have the rights on the white Nile and they have no rights on the blue Nile. And Ethiopia has never been at any meeting. And they didn't go to the 29 meeting, they didn't go to the 59 meeting. They're not part of the agreement. So rather than insisting this agreement is what the law is, we have to think bigger. Now, the bigger question is the Nile is not big enough anyway. Right. You've got 10 countries sucking off the Nile. And all those, many of those countries are increasing the population very quickly. So the Nile River, as I told you, is not the most voluminous river. It's not the Congo River. Therefore, there's not enough water. So what's the solution? To big, think outside the box to build nuclear power desalination plants mm. and, and build the equivalent of a second Nile. I, I, I forget what the figures of uh, cubic meters of water are, but it's not a lot. I mean, I've been on the Nile and it's dry. One thing the Ethiopian dam will do is it will regulate the flow, which makes Sudan very happy. Yeah. It will also decrease evaporation because the dam is way up in the mountains. It's not in the desert. So there's many positive technical features but it doesn't even matter because there's not enough water in the Nile to begin with. So we have to start desalinating on the Red Sea, the Med Sea uh, water for the 10 African countries that depend on the Nile. So this is my, the small level of thinking kills us. And of course, it's very hard to get people to think big when they're under 
duress and pressure. I mean, I don't want to see anything happen to the Egyptian people, but you, you can't make these kind of demands, which are colonial legacy, and insist that you're, it's going to be your way or no way. And Trump just got sucked into it for a variety of reasons, which I know. And he, he just added fire to the flame, but he wasn't the cause of the problem. He just not a, he's just not a deep, deep thinker <laughs> to be charitable. Well, there's definitely a clash of the two Americas uh, embodied with, under the four years of Trump of this neocon faction and this other more traditional aspect or instinct that was there at least. So you had a bit of conflict, whereas it, it we've seen for the majority of the post Kennedy years, only sort of the, the more aggressive imperial unidimensional America. So at least that was refreshing to see a fight um, and no, and being reminded that there is some pushback in there somewhere. Um, I, is there any other question or thought the, before we, we close it out? Could I jump in real quick? And uh, a last question to Lawrence would be um, with regards um, Africa, how, how do we go about stopping the international funders of terrorism? Uh, you know, as in regards Mozambique, the Sahel, and Boko Haram? Uh, yeah, that's a tough question. One, one second, I hear my, my cat is crying. I think that was my cat. Um, anyway. <laughs> my, my, cat is, my cat is like a dog. It looks me. Yours too? I just got up to let my cat out. It was like bouncing off the walls. That's funny. That, that, that's, a, the air. I mean, that's a really... Tough question, because the opposite of development is, is destabilization. Mm. Now, how do you get peace? Uh, you know, John Paul, well, Paul VI in 1960s, 1967, Poplorium Progressio, his encyclical letter said the new name for peace is development. So you can't have peace, even though you have outside agitators coming in all over in France and Britain, all over Africa. Yet nevertheless, they wouldn't be successful if people had a higher standard of living. If you have people who are desperate for food, desperate for water, desperate to survive, desperate people are so easy to manipulate. I saw this in Nigeria. You can manipulate desperate people with very little effort. If you relieve the desperation, you actually then can have better control over the behavior of people in terms of pushing them in, in the right direction. The uh, instigation of these terrorist activities is, um, is, is, is multifaceted. Uh, and is, I can't give you a simple solution uh, now, but there are things that we do that help the terrorists. For example, the overthrow of Gaddafi. I mean, I, I can't think of a more stupid thing that we did that's been more harmful to Africa than any event that I can think of by an American president is the overthrow of Gaddafi. Sending people who are under control inside Libya and then releasing them across the Sahel and then boasting Boko Haram in other areas. That's counterproductive. Again, if you have economic development, hungry people are desperate people. So we leave hunger. Africa has all the agricultural capabilities to be a net food exporter. Not spend $30 billion a year importing food, but be an exporter. All these things are possible. So if you build up the standard of living of people, you, set, you build up an immunity, an immune system, if you will, to be manipulated by terrorist activity. Now that doesn't eliminate the ideological instigators of terrorism, but you... Uh, you, re you reduce the f territory that makes it fertile for their recruitment. Dry <laughs> up the, f the areas. Like if you go into uh, the Lake Chad Basin, that place is ripe because people are dying and starving because, and the only method they know is their parents' method, which is not working because the lake dried up. And so those are the easiest people to recruit to terrorism. They don't have to be followers of the Quran. They are, obviously aren't. They just have to be desperate. So therefore, uh, northern Nigeria is a complete disaster in the Borno state. Um, how do we leave that? Give people, raise the standard of living. It's not simple, 
But it's the idea is simple. To do it is not simple. And if we, my view is, for the last 50 years, if we had spent our efforts and money, credit, uh, on development, the Sahel would look completely different today. And Africa would look, if we had built, trans, if we had built Transaqua in the 80s and 90s, Central Africa would not be the disaster it is today. The Congo would not be the disaster it is today because it would be flourishing economic development from Transaqua. So people will say, oh, gee, you can't do that. Well, look at the consequence of not doing it. Money and people have been wasted. Precious human beings have lost their lives because of stupidity and not understanding basic philosophical economic principles. And, and could, could one add to that, to what you just said, the, the role of the, um, the MNCs? So like in the situation in, in Eastern Congo, where you've got Rwanda, uh, Rwanda benefiting from the mineral wealth in the Kivus and Ituri. So you've got Rwanda doing very well in terms of development, um, but unfortunately they're doing well on the back of, yes, Kagame's um, development policies, but also on the back of the instability which is being run by Rwanda in, in the Eastern Congo states. So, and, uh, you know, who's propping up Rwanda? Well, that gets into a whole nother topic, but there, there's also that issue. It's not, um, you know, the militancy has a, 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 a deeper thread to it in that area at least. Look, there's no question. I mean, when you get into these areas, this country versus that country and what they're doing, the, the, there are real issues, no question about it. But if you, if you keep looking downward at what's in front of you and the problems immediately in front of you, you lose the ability to think how to get out of the whole mess that was created over 500 years. You've had a half a millennium of atrocities of various levels leading up to neoliberalism against Africa. So you, you, that's, your, that's the guts of your problem. It's 500 years of slavery, colonialism, neocolonialism. And you can't simply, that's why I was very upset about this Egypt, uh, Ethiopian position, because as Matt pointed out, Egypt has done some remarkable things in development. So these are very tough, uh, issues that have been there for hundreds of years, like getting houses in northern Nigeria to trust Ibus and getting uh, Aramas in Ethiopia to work with Tigrayans. These are, these are issues that have gone on for a long time, and there is no simple regulation or law that's going to stop them. Uh, you can't just say, well, okay, well, we'll, we'll issue this order, we'll issue that order. Like, like what's going on now, I don't agree with uh, you're going to have uh, Twitter and Facebook, they're going to bar Trump. But is that going to really change the way people think? You have to change the way people think. And we need leaders who are thinkers, who will then lead their country and help them change the way they think. And uh, we're, we have a dearth of leadership around the world right now, especially in the, in the West. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that that's a... Uh... That's a very good way to wrap up today's seminar. I, I want to just really thank you, Larry, for sharing all of this, this wisdom you've accumulated over the years with all of us. Um, for everyone in here who um, has remained on till the end and oh, got a sturdy, a sturdy group, 21 still uh, hung on. I'm, that was great. I'm shocked. <laughs> good endurance. Um, thank so, you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thank, thank you all for being on. And I would just like to make the announcement as well that uh, next Sunday we have Madeleine Therrien, who is going to be going through um, a little introduction to Paul Lawrence Dunbar, an underappreciated, incredible, immortal soul um, who was an assistant to Frederick Douglass and created the, the foundations. He had a real insight into how to create an American Renaissance uh, process um, that will overlap into the life of W.E.B. W. Dubois. Um, and his, some of his disputes with Booker T. Washington, uh, some of the work that McKinley was doing, and uh, the Wright brothers maybe even as well, as far as I can understand, Madeline. Oh. Am I right? Yeah, okay. I, I did, yeah, it's yeah, going to okay. be, be very, very broad. 
But I was very pleased because um, this whole discussion that we just had and your introduction actually from earlier on, uh, we talked about the two different systems. I think they have never been more obvious than during Don Barr's lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I'm, I'm, I was very pleased with that introduction. So it's kind of an introduction for my presentation as well. Beautiful. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Subscribe, to my, subscribe to my blog. You'll get everything <laughs> once a week, twice a week. Great. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Hey, till next Thanks, time, everyone. Larry. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Night. Great job, Larry. Thank you. Thank you. Oh,